fortunate enough to catch it. Yeah. <laughs> well, she works in a hospital. Well, that's the thing, but normally, you know, because she's been hospitalized for years, years. Yeah. she's only been sick maybe a handful of times, you know. And she, was, she hasn't been sick like this, but she can't get out of bed for 15 years. Good morning, Dad. Because so, you just build up, you know, dollar and energy. That's why you do a thing here to sick people. Yeah. But, it, 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 it's her good. Yeah. It's a numbers game. I've known several people who've had it, customers. It's just kind of a strange time of year, you know what I mean, to, to get, if it is like a respiratory flu. Well, we've had, a, we've had some, a lot of dry weather. We've had a lot yeah. of uh, junk in the air. Yeah. And I think that plays a role in it. Uh, yeah. Seasonal allergies and all mm -hmm. the junk in the air. I'm going to get this opened up. I'm going to give people a few more minutes because... It's 9.31 and there's only uh, six, Is seven. Is it 9.30 already? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 9.30 exactly, yeah. Okay. Hey, Ed, turn me down. We'll hit the bell here in a minute, but it feels yeah. like I'm a little loud. Okay. Well, the ladies are downstairs. So yeah, ladies are downstairs. There's 25 ladies. And downstairs. I know we have a lot of people on vacation right now and out of yeah. town. Yeah. Angela and Perry, they had their daughter got married, Amanda, so they're down in Alabama for their wedding yesterday. So hopefully that went well. And um, you know, Patrick, and Patrick and Nicole and the family are out of town and the whole uh, last week before they left uh, Kareen let me know that the, the Suetas and the Bewicks and the uh, what is it Zimbalotti's they're all in uh, uh, Hilton Head so yeah so we have we have at least five five families that I know of I hope the Eric or five or six that are up later let's summer you know we had juice coming so everybody's starting their vacations and yeah doing everything so it's that time of year yeah and I hear the women's studies going good downstairs, so that's good. Yeah. Women's class downstairs. Oh, is it? I gotta go downstairs. Yeah. Oh my God. You don't have to go downstairs. You could you could go to either one you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is still this is still. I guess I forgot. Auto, yeah. It's for, still okay. Yeah, you can still sit so up here. So what are you what are you talking about this morning? We're doing proverbs. Oh, okay. That's good yeah. for. Okay. If you want some of God's wisdom, stay up here. I want God's wisdom always. Not that you can't find it in the book of James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a good, that's a good book, too. I'm just teasing. Yeah, so whatever whatever you want to do. Okay, good. All right, so let me open this up get and we'll get started. That's, a, that's better. <laughs> I mean, Proverbs is pretty hard to beat. I it mean, really is. You know? Even though James is like the, the, the junior book in the New Testament to Proverbs, they often call James the Proverbs of the New Testament. Yes. Uh, obviously a, a tad bit shorter. <laughs> All right. So do you guys have your sheets from last week? I think it was choosing the right path, I believe, right? Yes, we do. If, if you don't have a sheet from last week, there, uh, Ed said there's more in the back. So does anybody need a sheet? I can grab it. I'll get it for you. Hey, can you get a few sheets? Lewis is running some more off. Okay. That's good. Jeremy and Roxanne. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Mary, do you need a sheet? Okay, Mary will need one as well. Is this it, Dave? Yeah, choosing the right path. No, nope, that's wisdom and fear. He's the other one. Okay, so uh, Lewis is running Lewis some is copies running? off, okay. so Good. we'll have some up here in a few minutes. Okay. So last week, you know, I was trying to do one per week, and you know, Tony was talking so much last week, we couldn't really get past the introduction. You know? <laughs> I know. It Tony, was, you got to stop. It was almost that, ridiculous. I, I, I was about to hand him the microphone. You I know? think it was since he's yeah, retired. Yeah. That's what happened, right? Yeah, lots yeah. Of energy. Tony. A lot more energy. That's right. Uh, a lot more energy. No, I, I tease, I tease. So, so last week we, I handed out the sheet, and we didn't even get through the introduction. So, so just for you younger guys, you know what I mean? Not that you're that much younger than me, but a little bit younger than me, some of you. You know, when you're teaching, actually I'm looking around, I think it's only two. <laughs> but when you're teaching, right? Jerry McKinney told me a long time ago, because he, he, him and Larry were two of the first that started mentoring me, and then Rick Gilmer. And I used to like, I was so nervous and I would put all these notes together. I'm thinking, I gotta, I gotta get through all these notes. And he said, quality over quantity. He says, if you don't get to them, you don't get to them. Mm -hmm. He goes, and if you teach next week, you just pick it back up where you left off. Where I would try to rush, you know, hurry up, try to fit it all in, you know. And yeah. so, so over time you learn, quality over quantity. If you're having, if, if it's going good and you only get a little bit, hey, it was a good conversation. That's how I feel last week was. We did the introduction. We were in, uh, so we went over what is a proverb and what is a wisdom, and then I had you guys open up to, what was it, uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 29. Mm -hmm. And so let's go ahead and open that for a second, Proverbs 29. 
Uh, we're just gonna touch on that for a second and then we're gonna get into the questions. Uh, yep, thank you, Lewis. Uh, Roxanne oh, and Mary you, and Jeremy needed a copy. If anybody else needs a copy, just raise your hand. I got one, thank you. All right. So as we were looking at this last week, we looked at Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 27. That's where we were, and that's kind of where we parked, and we basically uh, hit on that, right? Uh, and and in, in that proverb it says, An unjust man is abominable to righteous, and he who is righteous in the way of the Lord is abominable to the wicked, right? And so we, we talked about, we started to get uh, talking about how uh, love, the, love the man, right? Hate the sinner, right? We are to, you know, and we talked about how if God calls something an abomination and you're a disciple of, of, of God, a disciple of Christ, what should you feel on the same matter? You should feel the same way. Because remember, who, who here could give me a, the definition of a disciple? We're all disciples of Christ, so somebody raise their hand and give me a, a definition for a disciple. Lewis, I know you started to, so... You want to go ahead? A disciple is one who commits to following Christ's teachings. Uh, one who commits to following Christ's teachings, not as he sees fit, but as Christ seen fit in teaching them, right? So you're to mirror your life after your Lord and Savior, right? So if Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, calls something a sin, you better be a sin in your eyes. If they call it an abomination, it better be an abomination in your eyes, right? Now... The person, the sinner's not an abomination because God says, I don't desire anybody to be saved, right? It's like Peter. But he, but he wants us to go out and take the message to everybody in love with gentleness. And so we teach in love with gentleness, but never watering down the truth. Because when we start to water down the truth, we're starting to tell people, well, yeah, God calls it a sin, but, right? And so we have to make sure there's never a but after what God calls sin, Okay. And so that's what we started to look at last week was that, uh, that, that chapter 29 and verse 27. <laughs> the other thing that we hit on just briefly before we move on is we were talking about that in, this, uh, in society, in an American society, we live in a, what they call a pluralistic society. And what does that really mean? That just simply means that in the United States, we have a society that accepts many different people, right? All different backgrounds, different uh, parts of the world, immigrants. Are we a nation of immigrants, right? And so the uh, melting pot, if you've heard that phrase, right? Different sexual orientations, different religions, different cultures. I mean, that's what makes up America, okay? Uh, and so we live in a pluralistic society. And then those different groups, they have what? They have individuals who petition uh, their local representatives, right? To, to, push a, to push through their causes. And so that, and I mentioned some of them last week, right? You got the conservatives, you know, the, 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 the conservatives and the liberals, but really the, the far right versus the far left, where, where they hate each other. And remember how I talked about how this is a book of contrasts, right? You got the pro-life and the pro-choice, right? And is there any middle ground usually? Nope, you know what I mean? And so people start to draw the battle lines, right? So you have the battle lines being drawn and you see, that's why nothing gets done in Washington anymore, because it used to be where it was more center right, center left, and you disagreed on some things, but there's some things that you could come together and rally around and, and, and get some things done for the good of the country. But now you have such far extremists that have hijacked both parties in a lot of senses that now it's hard to get anything done because they really truly hate each other. And you see it with all the vitriol, uh, that's being spoken, all the venom that's being spewed towards one another. So at the end of the day, when we think about this, that Proverbs 29 and verse 27, that's why I said last week, man, you read that verse, it explains a lot. <laughs> explains a lot because that's exactly what we see, right, today. And you think about it for in another way. Hold your place uh, in the book of Proverbs, but I want you to open it up to John 17, 14. In John chapter 17, Michael, hello. In John chapter 17 and verse 14, you're going to see uh, Jesus as he's giving the high priestly prayer. You're going to see uh, him make a statement here. And I want you to pay attention to this statement. And then we'll look at another one in 1 John. John 17, 14, if somebody wants to read that. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. 
because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Okay. What is something that stands out to you? Remember, Proverbs 29 and 27, right? The, you know, looking at that, the wicked hate the righteous and the righteous hate the wicked, right? What they stand for. Uh, not necessarily the person, but what they stand for ideologically. And then you read here in Jesus, he's praying to the Father in the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Why has the world hated them? It's because of, Go ahead. Because of the, they're the other party. They're not of this world. All right. It's really they hate them. Yeah. It's that first, so they're not going to listen to anything. Yeah. Today. And so they hate them because their moral code is so diabolically uh, uh, opposed to their moral code and standards. And so you have God's way and you have man's way. Okay? And another one, you don't have to turn there. I'll do this one for you, but let's flip back to Proverbs. But in 1 John 3.13, it says, it tells us, do not be surprised if the world hates you. Right? Well, why does John say that through the Holy Spirit? Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Why does John tell us that? First John. Christians and the world are diametrically opposed to one another. Yeah. The humanist and the Christian are diabolically opposed to one another. That's, do you not see that in society today? Right? Just for example, I'm, I was looking at one of the news stations yesterday, and one of the governors, I think it was Arkansas, I could be wrong on the state, but they, they, they were re reinstituting, uh, putting up the, the Ten Commandments, and he's catching all this flack for it. He says, you look at what's going on in society, and then, but I have the nerve to, offer, to, 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 to put into law that the Ten Commandments are going to go back up, go back up, you know what I mean, and be a beacon for the community and for the state. I mean, are they really all that diabolical? You know what I mean? And so you think of the Ten Commandments, and yet the world would look to tear down all of that because, as Randy used the word diabolical, it's a good word, it's diabolically opposed to what everything they believe. And so that's where you look at the Christian, right, versus the humanist. What's a humanist? You guys know what a humanist is? Humanist is? Randy? There is no absolute truth. A humanist believes whatever is right is whatever is right in their mind at this moment. Yep. There's no absolute truth, and whatever is right is right what's in their mind, right? Have you guys ever uh, read the book of Judges? Anybody here read the book of Judges? The very last book, uh, the very last verse in the book of Judges, and it says it three or four times through it, but the very last verse of the book of Judges says that they did all things that were right in their own minds. In that time, there were no kings, so each man did what was right in his own eyes. And did you know what was right in their own eyes? Sexual immorality, murders, <clears throat> thefts, adulteries, idolatry, broken homes. The list could go on and on and on. But that was what was right in the eyes of man. And you know what the sad part is? In the eyes of what was supposed to be God's chosen people. Right? And so, again, if you, Jesus says, if they hated me, they will hate you. And what do we see? If you truly, and I know so I use the word truly, if you truly live out your faith as you're supposed to, as thus saith the Lord, people will hate you. If you take the word out regularly and you speak to people still with love and gentleness about God's moral standards and how if you continue living this way in your life, because you're basically letting them know that you're living opposed to God's standard, and that if you continue to do so and you don't repent, that you're going to be eternally lost, how well do you think that message is received by a worldly individual? It isn't. It's not. It's, trust me, I've had some of these conversations. And I always say this. I've said this ever since I've been here. If you get zero persecution in your faith, you ain't doing it right. If you've received zero persecution, you ain't doing it right. Because I guarantee you, you ain't taking the truth out to people, whether it's friends. I'm not even talking the world. I'm talking friends, family members, co-workers, people you have relationships with. If you teach what God's word teaches, and, and you do it in love, and with gentleness, you're going to get pushback. 
you're going to get people who won't want to, uh, even family members who won't want to have a relationship with you anymore. That's just speaking the truth. So thoughts on that before we move on? Uh, Pat. Um, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light, does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Amen. Amen. Where is that, Pat? John 3, 19 through 21. So you look at that, right? And then even if you go to, the, I think it's in John, at, towards the end of John chapter 12 or... Maybe it's towards the beginning or 14. I can't remember. But uh, it, it was talking about how that there were many people who believed in the Christ, but because of man, they would not confess belief in Christ because they feared man more than they feared God. Right? What happens when you fear man more than you fear God? What happens? Raise your hands. Bill? You follow the way of the world, right? And you just kind of like one of those dumb sheep that, you know, the sheep are headed off into the distance and there's a cliff and a, a pretty steep drop off and some of them are going to their death and you know what some of the other sheep do? Walk right off that cliff. Right behind them. And I'll never forget, I was talking to Chris Kenzie, one of the deacons over at Sunset many years ago, and, in, and, and then after one of his classes, he, and it was so true, he used the, he used the phrase that, Many of us Christians are like those dumb sheep, right? Where we follow the path of least resistance, right? And we don't want to ruffle any feathers. We don't want to anger anybody. We don't want to cause any problems and or disputes. And so we just kind of we just kind of fall in line. Does God want people to fall in line? If he wants people to fall in line, he should have never sent out his disciples. Right? Exactly. He wants them to fall in line in his line, but I'm talking about in the sense of, you know, getting behind what everybody has to say because let's just make peace and not war. Are we not in a spiritual battle? Yes. We are in the midst of a spiritual battle. But you're only in the spiritual battle if you put on the armor of God and you actually get in the fight. Right? And when I say get in the fight, I'm talking about Get out there and do the things that God calls you as one of his disciples to do, right? To take the word out. That's our number one goal is to take the word of God out into society. And when he sent out the disciples two by two and he told them, don't take the extra money belts. Don't take the extra cloaks. Don't take the extra pair of sandals. You go and God will provide. And if you go into the town and you come into somebody's house and they receive you, let your blessing stay up on that house. But if they don't, and if nobody receives you, dust your sandals off and move on. He didn't say sit there and beg them. Sit there and plead with them. Please accept my Lord. Please listen to what I have to say. He said, no, go. And you keep going. And if you got, sometimes you stay because they receive. And sometimes you dust your sandals off and you move on. So when my father became a gospel preacher, his family turned away from him. And I was three years old when my dad yep. began preaching. Well, I hadn't seen his side of the family. I never, I didn't remember them. Yeah. At my mother's funeral, my dad called me up front and said, Rand 11, don't you recognize these people? I said, I'm sorry, Dad, I don't. Well, it was my uncles and my aunts from my dad's side of the family. Uh, I'd, I'd never seen them. Yeah, yeah. So he was saying when he put on Christ, when his dad put on Christ, right, and followed the truth, family disowned him. There's lots of stories like that, Luana. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Yeah, I, love that. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I yeah. come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against yep. her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Yeah. Yeah, she's talking about Matthew chapter 10 there, and then leading up to that chapter, and in that chapter, it's talking about how discipleship, discipleship is going to be hard, right? And, and that, I've taught classes on that. I've, I've done sermons on that. I love that verse because it's a, it's a great reminder, right, that you're to put God before mother and father, before wife and children, before anything that you hold dear. And when you put God first, 
it's going to separate families. Fathers are going to turn against sons, and mothers are going to turn against daughters, and vice versa, and mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws. There's going to be a contention, and there's going to be a separation. And that's why Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. But isn't it interesting, though, that everybody thinks that Jesus came to bring, you know, just peace and love, and, you know, that he'll accept you no matter, you know, who you are, no matter what your sins are. You don't have to change. Just come as you are. You see it on the buildings all the time, right? Uh, you know, because you have all of these denominations who have, and even some of the Lord's Church, so I'm not going to just poo-poo on them, even some of the uh, Churches of Christ, where they have now given over to the world, and they're just looking to get anybody in, and they're looking to uh, pack church buildings for nefarious reasons, right? For reasons of men and not reasons of God. And so, yeah, I, I love that verse because the, the, the word of God is a sword, and that's why I said a few minutes ago, if you've never received any type of uh, persecution, and I don't even like to use persecution because in, in the real sense of the persecution, none of us have been persecuted, right? In, in the real sense of it, religiously speaking, right? <laughs> like we see overseas and like we see in other areas. But at the end of the day, you can still have people turn against you. It's a form of persecution. Families, right, deny you, form of persecution, right? I mean, because you're being persecuted because of your beliefs in Almighty God. So, last thoughts before we move on. That sword that Christ was talking about is this book right here. Yeah. And yeah. it separates people, the believing, the believers from the unbelievers, yep. the Christians from the world. <clears throat> Christ brought love. It's the reaction to Christ that yep. brings the hatred. Absolutely. And, and to his word that brings the hatred. And that's why he said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. The full arm of God is not an offensive weapon. Yep. It's, it, it is there to protect us, the shield, of, and the sword, yes, the sword can cut deeply into the yep. flesh, but it is not necessarily going out to beat somebody over the head with. Yeah. It is a defensive method of defending the gospel, yeah. because you use the word to defend and block, not necessarily to go to stay up and to yep. kill. So when we look at the full armor of God, God said, just wear this, I'll protect you. Yeah. But you get out there and do the fight. Yeah, and the full armor of God is to protect you, but the sword, the word of God, will cut deeply. Yeah. Right? I just wanted to throw in the verse, Hebrews 4, yeah. 4 verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest that says, don't fall according to the example of disobedience. For yep. the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit, mm -hmm. and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. Amen. And, and that's, that's, that's truth right there, right? And we need to understand that the word of God will cut deeply. The armor of God is defensive in nature, right, to protect. But you have a sword for a reason, right? And that sword is going to divide. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, that's exactly what's going to take place. And you need to be prepared. Because when your mom wants to leave you, or your dad wants to forsake you, or it starts to divide your family, you got a choice to make, Tony, right? You could choose me, or you could choose them. What happens when we make the wrong choice, right? Yeah. It, it cuts us, and it also puts us outside of God. And we have to remember, not, no, it helps, that um, just like we're, when we fall in line, we're doing what, what, what God's will is instead of man's will, follow what God says and what the work, what the girl wants. When they reject you, they aren't rejecting you, they're rejecting you. Amen. 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 You, you just let, that's, why, that's why you can let that go. Yeah. You that's remember that. Samuel the prophet? You guys remember Samuel the prophet? He was so mad, right? When they want, when the, when the Jews wanted a king, you know what Samuel thought? He was, they rejected me. And God looked at Samuel and said, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. You know what I mean? He, you're, you're my servant last time I checked. <laughs> you speak for me. And so Samuel was all in his mind, and he meant well. You know what I mean? They're rejecting me. And God says, no, they're rejecting me. Right? You, you were led by Almighty God. He fought your battles for you. When you were faithful and you always won, wouldn't even lose any soldiers. Right? Sometimes soldiers wouldn't even have to go out into battle. He would just come and take care of it. 
And then you saw, and then you said in your mind, we want to look like the rest of the people around us. Give us a fleshly king. We want a man to rule over us. Do you, do you see why the word of God says in Proverbs, there are ways that seem right unto man, but in the end they lead to death? You chose man over almighty God. And so let's, let's move on. So the on your sheets, the first question that I have for you there, number one, what expressions are used in the book of Proverbs that describe the right path? Okay? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand out some of these real quick. Uh, Randy? Yeah. Proverbs 3, 6. You got it? I got it. Lewis, you got your Bible too? Yeah. Proverbs 3, 17. Uh, Jim? Proverbs 4, 11. All these are going to be in Proverbs. So if you guys, are books are open. Uh, Mike, you want to read one? Proverbs uh, 4, 18. Bill? Proverbs 5, 6. Jeremy, you got yours? Proverbs 8, 20. Mike, you got yours? No, my uh, phone froze up. On. Okay. Uh, Roxanne, Bill? If one of you could read uh, Proverbs 9, 6. Who else? Thomas? Uh, Proverbs 15, 19. And then we'll get some of the other ones to read the next number, the next uh, set. All right, Proverbs 3, 6. Now, let's, as, you got to your, as you turn to your page, let's uh, listen to this. So the question was, what expressions are used in the book of Proverbs to, to identify, describe the right path? Yours says what? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Okay? So the descriptive word there is straight, right? In all your ways, if you follow Almighty God and his teachings, your crooked path will become straight. Okay? Proverbs 3.17. Who had that one? Her ways are pleasant ways. All her paths are peace. Okay? All her paths are peace. Right? Jesus says, my burdens are light, right? And so all those who are weary, all those who are troubled, come to me and I'll give you peace for your souls, right? Uh, Proverbs 4.11, who had that one? I do. Okay. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. Okay. So wisdom, right? I have directed you in the way of wisdom. Uh, Proverbs 4.18, who had that one? Okay. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Okay. So we see there that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. What does that mean? It just simply means that the way is going to become brighter. It's going to become clearer. Because when you turn your life over to God, the waters are no longer muddied. Right? Right? It's like you go down to the Bahamas, which I've never been there, but I've seen pictures, and I always like, man, I wish I could go there. And you look at the water from what I've seen on television, and it's just like crystal clear. And you can see all the fish, and it's just gorgeous looking. I don't know, some of you may have experienced it. I always wanted to see it, but it's like that just crystal clear water. When you, when you stop focusing on what saith Dave, what saith my friends, and you focus on what saith the Lord, all of a sudden, the muddy waters become crystal clear, and you can see clearly, and your days become brighter and clearer. Who had uh, Proverbs 5, 6? Okay. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths are crooked, but she knows the path. Okay. She gives no thought to the way of life, right? It's talking about life. It's talking about living a certain way. In order for those crooked paths to become straight, right? God gives us the plan of salvation. He gives us the blueprint for, for to adhere to heaven and or, to attain heaven. All you have to do is stay focused on the path of life. Uh, Proverbs 8 and 20. I have it. Okay. I walked in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice. All right. I walked in the way of righteousness and the paths of justice. <clears throat> It's justice, right? It's one of those words that describe the right path. Justice, right? God says that we're all going to stand before God and give an account of our lives, right? Based on his standard. 
God is a God of justice, right? He is, there, there's nobody who's going to come before God and be able to pull the wool over his eyes, right? You know, God is a God who's going to, when you stand before him, he knows everything. You ever watch any of those court shows, right? Uh, the, the Judge Judy's, and I think there's a, another one, something brown or whatever. There's like two or three of them, right? At least there was. I don't know if there still is. but if, There's a bunch of them. But you watch it sometimes, right? And you got these simple-minded sometimes people talking to the judge. You think the judge ever heard uh, some, some crazy uh, nonsense, right? And, and then you start to learn how to decipher body language, and you start to learn how to decipher, uh, you know, when somebody's lying and when somebody's telling the truth. And it's hilarious when you see these, uh, these knuckleheads trying to pull one over on the judge, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then you watch to see how the judges respond, and it's, it's kind of funny. And so you're going to stand before God. He knows your heart. You know when he spoke to the when he spoke to the, uh, to the to the Jews and he spoke to the the Pharisees right and the scribes and the Sadducees, how was he able to give the right proverb in every single situation? Because he knows the hearts and minds of all men. So even when many of them were thinking in their mind, well, if this is the Messiah, he wouldn't let this woman touch her. If he was the real Messiah, and Jesus says, let me ask you a, let me ask you a question, all right? He knows their thoughts. He knows their hearts. He knows their deeds. It says when you stand before God, you're going to have to give an account of everything you've ever said and did. And yet we still think we could get one over on God. And so the next one, uh, Proverbs 9, 6. Okay, wisdom hath built her house. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, forsake the foolish and live. And go in her, you go in the way of understanding. Forsake the folly and live. Proceed in the way of understanding. <clears throat> understanding according to what? The will of God. The word of God. The way of God. Last one, Proverbs 15, 19. The way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of an upright is a highway. Okay. Proverbs 15, 19. The, it talks about the descriptive word. There's highway, right? You guys ever been on one of those backcountry winding roads? How clear is the path? Hmm. West Virginia, you can't see around the turn. You can't see around the turn. Lots of places. You get off the, you get off the beaten path, right? You get on some of these backcountry roads between you know, the, 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 all the trees and the vegetation. Sometimes the cornfields. You, you can't see much of anything, right? You just see just a little bit in front of you. What happens when you get out on the highway? How far can you see then? Right? You can see a long ways. And so the way of the Lord is like a highway, meaning that life will have trouble, but on the highway of God, things become clear. Right? For now, I could see better. I could see farther. I could anticipate something happening. You sometimes, you come around that corner, it happened to our dear brother Darren, right? Mm -hmm. Darren is racing down that mountain on his bike, and it, it's one of those winding, turning roads, and a truck coming with the trailer, and he's coming around, and bam, right? Months and months and months of therapy and doctor's appointments and medical bills, right? Because the path wasn't clear. Is that a good analogy, right? But yet, when you're on the highway, you can see the accident a long way off, right? And so what happens? You can take uh, caution. You can be prepared. Okay? Next question, number two on this list. So these are, those are some expressions that are used in the book of Proverbs to describe if you're on the right path. The next question says, number two, what are some benefits that result from walking in the path of the Lord? Well, in Proverbs 4.18, we know that the righteous experience joy. And this is one of the ones that we just read. The righteous experience joy, and as they move along life's path, the path becomes brighter, the path becomes clearer. Proverbs 6 and 23 tells me that your commands, O Lord, are a lamp and a light, just like they are in, Pro in, in Psalms 119, 105. You guys have heard that lots of times, right? A lamp to my feet, a light to my path. So the word of God, if you look at, you know, what does it do for you? It, it, it is a light to your 
uh, to your feet, right? A lamp to your feet. Anybody here ever get out of bed in the middle of the night and stub your toe? Because you didn't turn a light on and you're just trying to, you know, go based on your memory. And then you, you stub your toe. Furniture doesn't move. Right? Furniture doesn't move. It hurts. Right? It also hurts, your, it also hurts when you stub your toe of sin sometimes. Because let's just be honest, right? You could be forgiven of anything. But I tell people, I tell the young adults all the time, but it doesn't mean you don't actually still have to deal with the consequences to your sin. You can be forgiven, but there's still consequences, right? If I go out and commit a heinous crime, I could ask God for forgiveness, and he knows my heart of whether I'm sincere or not, but don't I still got to serve my time? You see, there's consequences, you know? So that's part of that is seeing clearly to understand that there's the right way, there's the wrong way, they're diabolically opposed to one another, and at the end of the day, there's consequences, whether good or whether bad. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So we continue to look at what are the benefits, what are the results of following the path of the righteous. And in Proverbs 10 and 9, it tells me, he who walks in integrity walks securely in the Lord. What does that one mean? He who walks with integrity walks securely in the sight of the Lord. What do you think, what do you think he means by that? Lewis? When you stand with truth behind you, mm -hmm. you have a confidence yeah. that I, I, the, the Lord will back me up. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So my son Noah right now, uh, he's uh, he just to fill out for, it's called OSI, I think it's like that. It's like a, a, like a investigative unit type of something, you know what I mean, in the, in the military. Um, and I still don't know a whole lot about it, but long story short, uh, his commander just signed off on it for him, and then it's, it's going through, and all the paperwork to go through, so hopefully the next six weeks we'll find out. But the bottom line is, the, the commander asked him, do you have anything in your past that's going to prohibit you from getting, he goes, I'm not saying arrest, because we'll know about that, that's going to be on the record. But is there any of the, the dumb things that you didn't get arrested for, but when they start to investigate, and they're going to call a bunch of different people, and they start to ask about Noah Shostak, what are they going to find out? Do you got any skeletons in the closet that we need to know about now? Because I might as well not even fill this out. Because once they find the skeletons and they'll find them, he says, you ain't, you ain't getting this. You know what I mean? And Noah's like, no, I, I don't have anything. You know what I mean? He goes, I haven't done anything. You know what I mean? And he's like, come on, there's not something. He's like... Well, yeah, I mean, I did little things as a kid, you know what I mean? But nothing, like, illegal or, you know, something, nothing that's going to, you know, you know, cause me to not have a position or something like that. And so the bottom line is, though, God knows all things, and these organizations will find out one way or another, right? I mean, think about, like, they're putting up justices, right, for Supreme Court every so often, right? And you look at these now, right, the diabolically opposed uh, factions in our, in our politics, they're pulling up stuff going back into college and college parties and high school parties and, you know, stuff that happened 25, 30 years ago, and all of a sudden it's coming to the fore. If somebody's looking for dirt, they're going to find something, and that's what, that was the question. You know, where, what's your dirt? You know what I mean? Go I, ahead. My brother, this is in the mid-60s. He was graduating from college in engineering. He was going to work for NASA. It wasn't called NASA back then, but... And, and he got an interview, and at two, about 10 o'clock at night, he was knocking on the door, and two guys came in with suits on. Yep. He sat down in the dining room with my mother and father. We were in the back listening. And he says, okay, we're doing a background check on him, and we want to make sure, is there anything that he, we need to know? Yeah. And my mother said, oh, nothing. He's never been in trouble. He said, well, what about his sister, who was at Talladega, and she got arrested? They knew about my sister in Talladega in Alabama, and I'm down in Florida. And they asked him, and my mom and dad said, she did what? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know what they yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So we got to be careful. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So he who walks in integrity walks securely. I've often said to my sons and to others, you don't have to fear telling the truth if it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't have to remember I guarantee you somebody sues me for something that I didn't do, and they're trying to extort something or blackmail me. Dude, I'm fighting that tooth and nail. Yeah. If I know in my heart I am innocent, I'm not giving you a bunch of money just to make this go away. I'm going to fight this one tooth and nail. Because you don't have to be afraid if, the, if you know what the truth is, right? And so that's something to consider. Uh, the next one, Proverbs uh, 12 and 28 says that the path of the righteous leads to life. It's talking about eternal life. Yeah, sure, you can have a much better uh, peaceful, content life in the here and now. 
but in the end, eternal life. Proverbs 10 and 29 says that the path of the righteous is the, is the Lord's stronghold. What does it mean by the Lord's stronghold? What do you think that means? The stronghold of the Lord. The path of the righteous leads to the, long, the Lord's stronghold. It's like the church is a pillar and ground of truth. Pillar and ground of the truth. And it's uh, the same thing with uh, the way of the Lord is, is the truth. It's honesty. It's integrity. It's the, it's the whole shebang. Yep. And when you then allow yourself to be engrossed in the church, when you allow iron to sharpen iron, right, that I was just talking about earlier, you allow iron to sharpen iron, what, who does that benefit? You and the other person. It, 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 it benefits both parties. But all, I tell people regularly, iron can only sharpen iron if you allow yourself to be sharpened. Yep. Right? You, if you don't ever ask for help, if you don't ever ask for men, be, to, to be mentored, to be guided, to be led, should you expect then to receive those things? Mm -hmm. No. And so this is one of the problems that we see in the church regularly as, as you know, somebody who is a minister and then our leaders, our elders, right, uh, is that you see it regularly. People want help, but they don't want to ask for help. You know they need help, but they refuse to ask for help. Or they'll come forward and they'll say, hey, we just were asking for prayers. And then so the people offer to pray for them, but then also to offer assistance to them. No, no, I'm okay. You just asked for prayers, but yet you don't want help, you know. And pride is a dangerous thing, is it not? How often does pride get in the way? There's, God says there's always a hand available. Do you know how God works today? Through us. Through you. Through me. God's proud. There's not, it's not like the first century anymore, right? Where, thing, where all these miraculous, powerful things were just, boom, taking place. No, now God's providence works through each and every one of us. And so as God's providence is working in our lives, it's working me through Tony and Tony through me and vice versa. And as we help each other, we're God's representatives that are helping to bring glory and honor to God in order to help in any situation we can help in. And then and vice versa, there's going to come a time where I'm going to need said help. Anybody here never, ever need help at all with anything? Right? If you haven't, you've led a blessed life. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, I bet you say there's done. very, 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 very few people who've never needed some form of help. All right. Uh, we only got about two more minutes. Uh, let's do uh, one more. Proverbs 15, 24, the path of life leads upwards. I like that because upwards does not refer to heaven, but rather it refers to, it's a metaphor of success, right? It would be like someone saying today, upward and onward. Have you guys ever heard that? Upward and onward? Upward and success, onward. right? Things are going good. If you follow the path of the righteous, it's not to say you'll never have problems. Not to say you'll never have health calamities, but if you're following the path of the righteous, it's upward and onward. And that way, you're able to deal with the storms of life in a positive way, in a, in a way that's going to cause other people to say, what's different about Lewis? What's different about Pat? Why is it that even in the, some of the hardest moments of life, that these dudes... They find a way to put a, a, a happy face on it. They find a way, they find a way to spin something to, to look at the, the positive and not just the negative. What is it about them? And then know what gives you an opportunity to do? Talk about your Jesus. Talk about God and all the work that he's done in your life. You see, the way of the righteous is a way like the highway. Clears away the, the nonsense and you can see clearly. 23rd Psalm. Yea, do I walk with the God of Shadow of death, I will leave. Fear no evil, for thou art with me. Yep. That's the path that we should walk. Amen. Amen. Last thoughts or comments before we close it down. Roxanne? Dave, I like the, what mine says. It just says, all the days, uh, Proverbs 15, 15, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Yep. He who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. And again, remember, it's not that you'll never have problems. Because if you never have problems, you never have issues, let me know what your secret is. Because <laughs> right? Right. there's going to be problems, there's going to be things. But when you walk in the path of the Lord, right, you can feast on the goodness of God. All right. Pat, you want to lead us in prayer? I think I had you last time, right? Yeah. yeah. Pat. 
Our Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful for this opportunity given to us on the first day of the week to come before you.